today's sutta is again a special sutta because it goes back to it takes us back to the very important role that Lord Buddha gave to the breath, the breath meditation. Lord Buddha had mentioned several times in the suttas how the Tathagatas, the enlightened ones, the Buddhas, have all become enlightened using the breath meditation. And in addition to the breath, there's other meditations, of course, which Lord Buddha has delineated, shared with us, instructed his students. And this discourse is, is addressing that. This is a big one. This is uh, literally large sutta to cover. So. I will do my best. Uh, I think um, most probably it will be uh, done in more than one session for the amount of material that I uh, you know, have to cover just within the sutta itself. And um, so it's, uh, it's sutta number 118 from the Majjhima Nikaya which is the middle length discourses. And it is called the Anapanasati, which is the discourse on in and out breathing, in and out breathing. Um, and the sutta begins when uh, we see Lord Buddha having just finished the three month rains retreat, the Vassa. And uh, he looks around to the congregation and you can almost feel the quiet. And uh, as you're reading, as we're going over the sutta, as you'll see, and in October, um, the month of October, um, around that time, even though in India, they would use different months, uh, lunar months, but pretty much it falls within October month and uh, he's, he's very content with the progress being made. And then he says, uh, by the way, he's surrounded by uh, the greatest disciples, his disciples. Um, uh, the who's who of bhikkhus are there, basically. Um, and uh, he decides that he wants to stick around for one more month because he knows uh, as Lord Buddha, uh, he would scan the environment with his mind to see who's where at what level and what push, if we can say that you use that term, is necessary for some students to really at least become a sotapanna or a, one, uh, a, a stream mentor or stream winner. So he, at that point, decides to uh, stay for one more month and to give the students an opportunity um, to really advance, not, for, not just for those bhikkhus who are there, but the bhikkhus who were in the uh, surrounding area outside of the monastery, in the mountains, in the forests, in the uh, far away from the villages, in different regions. So the news gets uh, spread that Lord Buddha, after the retreat, after the rains is over, because his tendency was that once, not just his, other bhikkhus as well, when the Vasa is over, the rains retreat that we have to stay in for at least three months, um, we get up and we start moving. We go. Um, traveling to different places to take the Dhamma with us. And it's also a good exercise in those days because they didn't have cars 
And so they would have to walk. So Lord Buddha was the same. I mean, we learn the tradition from him as bhikkhus. But in this case, he decides to stay for one extra month. So when the other bhikkhus from different regions hear this, they start to flock, they start to congregate, come to uh, the city of Savati where this is taking place, uh, the sutta. And because this is a great opportunity, we don't want to miss this because who knows when Lord Buddha would come back. Um, and uh, this was not happening in the earlier days of the sasana, of the Buddha's dis teaching. Now, uh, within the, uh, the sutta itself, we see uh, how the sutta, technically speaking about the sutta, so it is broken down into the seven sets of practices uh, that go hand in hand um, and um, how it's broken down. Um, and he says these things for those because who are not yet awakened, of course. And there you see another uh, aspect of his compassion. Uh, he didn't just focus on the students who have made it, so to speak, but he would always look at everyone equally to try to get everybody to that level. Uh, so the primary focus is on the awakening of the student, therefore. So in that, he is using several th different strategies. He's bringing in the Satipatthana, uh, for one. Satipatthana are the four establishments of mindfulness, or four foundations of mindfulness, meaning the four postures or of the body. That's in the Kayanapasana, which is the body. Then we have the feeling. That's the second establishment. Then we have the mind, Chitta. And then we have the dhammas or the phenomena, uh, relationships or mind objects, you can even say, some people have translated. So the intention is, so there's a very strong connection of, uh, with this, uh, this, that this sutta has with the Satipatthana, the other giant in the suttas. Um, so you rarely see the anapanasati or the breath meditation mentioned anywhere in the suttas without some connection that ties it with the satipatthana. There's always a connection there. And because ultimately both of these uh, major suttas are talking about the same thing. They're trying to get the student to the progressive stages of awakening. But, 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 rising up the ladder of awakening of understanding and the mind is getting calmer and calmer and you're seeing things that you never saw before about yourself, about your mind. And that is where the insights that are happening. Now, having said that, therefore we are being taken to the four stages of sainthood, which I mentioned the first one, uh, stream entry or sotapanna or sotapatti. Then we have the Sakadagami, which is the once returner. Then we have the Anagami, the non returner. And then we have the Arahant. So these are all geared towards getting the student to those stages. So the Dhamma is not about just doing good, good things to others, about helping the climate, helping this, helping society. Yes, but those are the outermost branches of this tree, the major, major effort is being placed on getting the student to become developed, progressed well enough so they can actually personally taste these sublime states for oneself. Because the reason why Lord Buddha is saying I'm going to stay for an extra month is simply to give the opportunity for those who have not yet re uh, reached the, even the first stage. The first stage, as I mentioned, it's the Sotapatti or stream entry. That is the only place where when once a person has reached in their development, that they no longer will fall into the lower miserable realms. 
if you study the suttas, if you've studied the Dhamma proper, you will always see that to be the major deterrent as to why Lord Buddha taught in the first place. So we cannot teach the Dhamma, we cannot speak about the Dhamma, we cannot definitely practice the Dhamma without having that in focus. Uh, because I mentioned this because many times I see people say, well, I'm just doing meditation or the breath meditation for the sake of calm, tranquility. I'm not interested in Nibbana. I'm not interested in cutting myself from samsara. I'm not interested, I don't believe in rebirth, hells, heavens. Well, you're missing the boat. You're missing the entire show. You're missing the entire picture here. And um, so that is uh, why Lord Buddha would always point the, the attention of the individual listeners too, because there's these two things, the true knowledge and liberation, vidya, and vimutti. Those two things are what the person is aiming for because that is the only uh, station of understanding that can cut us from ignorance. So um, it's not just watching the breath. <laughs> so as some people have said, uh, so because we're after uh, understanding which takes us to uh, Nibbana. Now uh, again logistically or technically speaking the sutta is broken, the technique itself shall we say, it's broken into 16 steps, 16 um, yeah 16 steps and the 16 make up uh, if you divide it, it it makes up four tetrads or four bundles of four and um, so the first one, the first bundle um, addresses the just basic in and out breathing, observing the in and the out. And then the second stage of it is uh, um, the breath becoming an aspect of satipatthana, approaching it as satipatthana. And uh, the next aspect of uh, these suttas, um, these these uh, tetrads, is basically how we see the connection between the satipatthana itself, the establishments of uh, the establishments of mindfulness, and the bojhangas, the seven factors of awakening. So, um, and then we get to finally the attainment of true knowledge and liberation. So that is the four major breakdowns of the sutta itself. However, if we take those 16, we see how there is a progression, as you will see where we go over it, between, uh, um, I'll explain, of course, as we're going on over these, um, how it moves from watching the breath as short, watching the breath uh, in and out as, as long, the body of the breath, and then when you get to the, let's say from uh, five, six, seven, and eight steps, how they are addressing the feelings. And that's where we're getting into the jhanas. So oftentimes people say, well, the anapanasati um, doesn't have much to do with the jhanas. Well, it does, um, and, or the satipatthana doesn't, or that the bojhangas don't, well, they do together. And that's what Lord Buddha is also uh, pointing these things out. So ultimately, you are, if you practice the Anapanasati, that is the message, uh, the way I see it, there will be a mastery of the, the four foundations or establishments of mindfulness, Satipatthana, because you will be taking along with you, every time you're mindful of the breath, you're taking mindfulness in every single posture, whether you're rising up from your bed, whether you're waiting at the bus stop, where you're on the phone, etc. You're taking your mindfulness with you because the breath is always there with you. 
even if you let go of the breath, the breath will not let go of you. We might hold on to it. We might have shallow breathing, but it's still there. So it will help to get the person to have mastery of the satipatthanas, as well as the seven factors of awakening, which, uh, which is a <laughs> in layman's terms, we, you know, win-win situation. So, uh, so let's begin. And, and uh, there will be often times where I will stop and, and to bring clarifications. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, write them down somewhere to, so that you don't forget because sometimes they have a tendency of slipping the good questions. So um, write them down and, and at the end, uh, there will be Q&A period. Uh, so let's begin. Again, this is the from the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, which is the middle length discourses, uh, Sutta number 118. I have personally heard this. At one time, the Blessed One was living at the Pubba Monastery in the palace donated by Migara's mother, where the Blessed One was surrounded by his group of highly esteemed and learned senior bhikkhus such as the venerables Sariputta, Mahamugallana, Mahakassapa, Mahakachayana, Mahakottita, Mahakappina, Mahachunda, Anrudha, Revata, Ananda, and other learned senior disciples. Again, the who's who. <laughs> if you ever wanted to, if you had a time machine and you went back in time, this would be the night that I highly would recommend <laughs> Uh, approaching, although not being a bhikkhu, it would be almost impossible to get in. Um, but um, I've um, sometimes had the question of, of, of uh, Migara's mother. We see this a lot. And Lord Buddha was staying at Migara's mother's mansion, or it wasn't a mansion, it was a monastery. But for all intents and purposes, it, it was built as a palace by Migara's mother. Now, who is Migara's mother? Um, uh, it's basically Visakha, uh, the foremost uh, benefactress, the most, uh, she was uh, number one female lay disciple of Lord Buddha, who was so rich and she was so generous financially in supporting the sasana. The sasana would not have grown without her help and also Anatta Pindika. Anatta Pindika was the foremost male lay disciple. So each of them had built a monastery, one built in the western side of Savati, the city of Savati, the other one, Visakha, she built a monastery on the eastern side of, Sari, uh, of Sa, uh, Savati. Why? Because they sometimes, you know, they're very rich. So they, uh, Anatta Pindika would go walk to the uh, Anatta Pindika monastery, the one that he had built. Uh, but Visaka would like to entertain and in the sense uh, prepare food, everything for the bhikkhus so that they could come to her house. Uh, not where she lived, but she built the monastery for Lord Buddha to come so that he could teach them, her uh, children, her family, everyone else who would gather there. So why Migara's mother? In my earlier days, I would always wonder like what? Uh, Migara I thought is a child, is, is a female or somebody, you know, Migara's mother. Because the suttas don't mention Visaka. I put this in my translation so that you would know. Uh, uh, but uh, in generally, we don't see it, her name, just Migara's mother. That's it. Well, Visaka, when she was seven, her family was very, very uh, devoted to the Buddha. And uh, her grandfather pulls her over and says, Lord Buddha is coming today. And uh, gather your friends, come and listen. And she does. And they offer uh, flowers and, and all the respect they could. As Lord Buddha is giving the discourse, at the age of seven, Visakha becomes a Sotapanna. Seven. 
as a child. Now she grows up and she comes of age where she's going to be married. So, and her family finds her uh, a very wealthy uh, young, you know, man who is going to be her husband. But she insists that they, um, she really is upset because they don't, they are followers of the Jains, Nigan does. And she's like, uh-uh, that's not going to happen because he has to be an Upasaka. He has to have Lord Buddha as his refuge. Who are these people? They are naked ascetics, etc. So I'm not going to get too much into it, but basically uh, her father agrees that uh, as part of the dowry, they will include a, a group of elders to go with her and to live with her. Uh, in case she runs into some problems. Uh, so these are the senior advisors or the, like the tribesmen in a sense, the el elders, in case there's issues between her and her in-laws. And lo and behold, there is a problem because her father-in-law law is disrespectful towards Sasana, specifically towards the bhikkhus. And every time the bhikkhus would come to her mansion, now her own home, where her in-laws also lived, because it was a cultural thing. Uh, her father-in-law would prohibit her from giving food to the bhikkhus. So she was very brokenhearted because she couldn't do generous acts towards the bhikkhus. And she was very sad and upset. And one day, while one bhikkhu comes and stands in front of the door, and she says, you know, really upset, and she says, excuse me, uh, venerable sir, but Bhante, there's no food here for you because Migara, Migara is the father-in-law. We don't have fresh food here. Migara is eating yesterday's fare, meaning yesterday's food. Now the father-in-law hears this and he's very upset because they were very, very extremely wealthy. So they always had fresh food. So he said, why are you spreading rumors? What kind of a daughter-in-law are you? And why don't you get up in the morning and pay respect to us? As the father-in-law and mother-in-law, that was the custom for the newly wed, the bride, the daughter-in-law to do every morning she had to wake up before. But she didn't do that. She would wake up instead and she would go and pay respect. She would take the refuge. So she would go there first and she would spend time meditating and, and chanting whatever she had known of the suttas. So that was her primary goal in the morning. So she was not showing respect to her. And a series of similar events. And finally, he's fed up. He wants to send her home. At that point, she calls the elders. She says, this is the situation. What is your judgment? I will abide by your judgment. And they listen to both sides. And because they're elders, even the father-in-law has to listen to their judgment. And then uh, they ask her about the food part. Why did you say that your father-in-law is eating bad food, basically, yesterday? He says, venerables um, uh, or elders, uh, Migara is enjoying the consequences, the rewards of his actions from his past lives. That's why he is enjoying yesterday's fare. He's not eating anything, the benefit of any actions that he could be committing today of generosity, where he can share the wealth that he has. He's not doing that. And that's why I said that. And a few other things happen with the naked ascetics also. And she's like, I'm not going to bow down to them because they're highly disrespectful. And it's really uh, shameful for them to walk around the house naked, naked men inside. I can't entertain them. I can't pay respects to them like I would to the bhikkhus. So at that moment, Migara, the father-in-law, sees where Visaka was coming from. And he joins his palms together and he bows down to her, his own daughter-in-law. And he says, from this day forward, you are going to be recognized and declared as my own mother. 
Nigara's mother. So, um, and the Sutta compilers from the first day on apparently like that term better than just using Visakha. So um, that's something that I wanted to share. So next time you hear or see or read Migara's mother's mansion, we're talking about Visakha. Um, and, uh, and by the way, when you have the last syllable or letter elongated uh, with the diacritical mark, like in this case, it's Visakha versus Visakha. Um, in ancient India, they would use the same name for both male and female. But when you had the A ah at the end, it is for the female. So Visakha is the female uh, benefactress because there are individuals, students also advanced uh, male that Lord Buddha had whose name was Visakha. So, um, uh, so let's, you know, side notes. So continuing back, it was during that time that these senior bhikkhus were advising and instructing the junior monks where a single senior bhikkhu would be advising 10 junior bhikkhus while another 20 and another 30, while still another 40 junior bhikkhus. And in being instructed and guided in this way, soon the junior bhikkhus came to attain higher states of mind, never before experienced. It was then on a full moon night of the Pavarana ceremony during the Uposhita that the Blessed One was sitting outside under the moonlight, surrounded by the Sangha of bhikkhus sitting quietly around their teacher in silent contentedness. By the way, Pavarana is the time that we bhikkhus um, have just finished the rains retreat. And we invite those uh, other bhikkhus, especially those senior to us, to criticize us if we have done, said, or behaved in a way that is against uh, the rules or in any way, um, you know, disconcerting, anything that was off uh, that shouldn't have happened. So that is the invitation. Uh, and it's a, done very beautifully and it's, it's a very private. Uh, only bhikkhus have to do it and uh, um, in, in that setting. So everyone is outside, anyone who's not a bhikkhu. Um, so this kind of completes the rains retreat makes it official. Uh, so this has happened. So now we know the rains retreat is over. And uh, because we have the term Pavarana ceremony. And the Blessed One, after sweeping his mind over the minds of the silent Sangha of bhikkhus, addressed his disciples by saying, bhikkhus, I am quite satisfied with this mode of practice, a uh, progress. As I survey the Sangha, my mind is content with this progress being made. Therefore, bhikkhus, you must arouse much effort to attain what has not yet been attained, to realize what is yet to be realized, making the most of this time. For I will be leaving Savati on the Komudi full moon day of the fourth month, meaning he'll stay one more month. When we hear Lord Buddha say, you must arouse more effort. That means he knows that the student is not uh, completed the task. And so long as a person has not, the Buddha will always urge them to try harder, to go deeper, to spend more time. For example, Venerable Ananda, who had been already a Sotapanna for many years, uh, he took his sweet time, basically, uh, for over, um, I think it was like 25 years or so, he just did not push himself. And you find instances where Lord Buddha and even his own teacher, I mean, uh, Venerable Ananda's teacher, Venerable Sariputta, would urge Venerable Ananda to rouse more energy, more effort, to do the practice, to complete the task. But you know, it happened only after Lord Buddha died that he completed it. So you will find Lord Buddha always, always, always urging us to put more effort. 
So every time you hear something like this, so I encourage you to think that Lord Buddha's words are directed at you. At you. Enough with the sutta studies, enough with the, I don't know what, retreats, this and that. Are you really putting in the effort, honestly? Imagine Lord Buddha sitting across from you. He's urging you to rouse more effort. That's the kind of work that the energy that we have to work with every single day, uh, especially when we're on our own. So um, to create that sangvega, that, that urgency, which is absolutely a must. And the bhikkhus from around that region in hearing about the Blessed One's upcoming departure from Savati quickly made their way to come and see the Blessed One before he left. Now the senior bhikkhus continued to instruct and guide the other bhikkhus with even more fervency, whereby a single senior bhikkhu was advising 10 junior bhikkhus, while another 20, and another 30, while still another 40 other bhikkhus. And while being instructed and guided by the senior bhikkhus in this way, soon the other bhikkhus came to attain higher states of mind, never before experienced. And when we, um, as you notice in the beginning, the senior disciples who were surrounding, who were sitting around Lord Buddha, and each of them now we see are instructing 10, 20, 30, 40, or more bhikkhus. Each of these great disciples had their own flair, they had their own style, had their own technique in a sense. So had their own focus also. So, for example, if you had been with Venerable Anuruddha as your teacher, he would be guiding you through the Satipatthanas, but his attention would probably have been to take the student to experience the Dibba Chakku, the Divine Eye. Uh, if you were a student of Venerable uh, Maha, uh, for example, Maha, uh, Venerable Sariputta, his emphasis would be towards getting the person to experience uh, higher layers of wisdom because that's what he was known for. Venerable Mahakasapa, uh, uh, Maha Moggallana, his would be getting the student to attain uh, even uh, psychic powers. So in the comparison between both chief, chief disciples, Venerable Sariputta would take the new bhikkhus and he would instruct them to get them to the first stage, meaning Sotapatti, they would become stream winners, stream enterers. And then he would pass them on to Venerable Mahamogallana, the other chief disciple, because he was known to really get the students to arahantship very quickly. This is Venerable Mahamogallana. But to crack the egg, if you will, uh, of, of breaking through delusion and attaining sotapanna or stream winning, stream entry. That is the hardest part, they say. <laughs> and uh, Venerable Sariputta was known to get the student, the bhikkhu, to attain that stage, the first, quickly than anyone else. Uh, so, uh, so you had all this dynamic very fertile soil of, of awakening happening there. Uh, no deva realm could compete with what was happening there. No deva realm, no brahma realm could, any, could, have, could hold a candle next to this sublime environment where we are being included or invited in right now by this uh, introduction of this sutta. And on the night of the Komudi full moon day, during the fourth month's Uposhata, the Blessed One was sitting outside under the full moon surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus, sitting quietly around their teacher in silent contentedness. And the Blessed One, having scanned his mind, uh, with his mind, the minds of the silent Sangha of Bhikkhus, addressed his disciples by saying, Bhikkhus, this gathering of bhikkhus is without any useless talk. No chit chat going on. No talking about current events. How many soldiers the king has. 
how many dresses the queen has or who's the prettiest among none of that useless talk only dhamma and only necess if necessary without any useless talk as no one here engages in chatter this gathering is the pure essence of the true sangha such is the sangha bhikkhus such is this gathering it is such a gathering that it is worthy of offerings and hospitality the ones to be revered with joint palms at the heart the incomparable field of merit for the entire world such is this sangha bhikkhus such is this gathering and these are the qualifications of some of the qualifications of the the triple gem when we say the sangha i take refuge in the sangha the third portion uh these are the listings the qualifiers of what it is that we're talking about for a true sangha uh, they have to be worthy of our hospitality worthy even of our anjali they have to be worthy of uh, all these things that's how uh, the sangha can become the incomparable field of merit for the world that's why they're the highest but not just because the person is wearing robes having shaven head or saying some you know whatever so they that is what lord buddha is constantly going to uh, mention whenever he talks about the third as the refuge meaning sangha even if only a little is offered to such a gathering of bhikkhus just a little becomes enormous in its outcome as it bears much fruit let alone when much more is offered such is the sangha bhikkhus such is this gathering and that is why lord buddha would always encourage even you know he would take sometimes accept intentionally the the food a little bit like maybe a, a spoonful of porridge uh, that is not the best coming from very 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 impoverished elderly couple let's say or an old person or a beggar uh, on the street that has a piece of maybe even um, some uh, mold is growing on it some chapati or some bread like that and he would offer that to lord buddha lord buddha would accept it because of what that can turn for the person when the sangha is accepting gifts like this um, they are doing it out of compassion by the way that's why we're not beggars we are accepting the gift because of what this will turn into for the giver it will take them sometimes to heavens but again it has to do with the intentionality of when the person is giving something so it doesn't matter the amount or the type or the flavor of the food or the money whatever it it could be very very small very insignificant a chickpea even <laughs> a chickpea if you could or a rice grain if that's the only thing that they could offer but coming from a good place in their heart changes it all um a gathering like this is so rare to be seen in the world such is this sangha of bhikkhus such is this gathering of course we're dealing with the maha sangha at this point everybody's there plus at the top lord buddha so this takes it to a whole new level it is indeed worth traveling a very long distance on an arduous journey just to see a gathering like this such is the sangha of bhikkhu such is this gathering so again lord buddha is talking about here the four stages of sainthood so the whole sangha imagine the lowest level attainment is a sotapanna if you can imagine like it's it's i have a hard time imagining that personally uh because it's such a sublime sublime state for in this gathering there are bhikkhus who are arahants with all their mental contaminants asavas destroyed who have truly lived the holy life done what should be done and put down the burden by reaching the ultimate goal and destroyed the fetters responsible for further becoming as they are now completely released through final awakening 
There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who have already destroyed the five lower fetters to the sensual world and are to reappear spontaneously in the pure realms of anagamis, who will attain full release in those realms without ever having to be reborn into any state of becoming. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. So in addition to the arahants, we also have anagamins there. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who having already destroyed the three fetters are now greatly weakened in their lust, hatred, and delusion and are once returners. At the most to be reborn into this world once more when they will finally put an end to suffering by attaining full release. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who having destroyed the three fetters are now stream enterers, never again to fall into rebirth within the lower realms, firmly set on their sure path to final release. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. And um, he went over the, the fetters or the sangyojanas uh, to attain the sotapatti or sotapanna or the stream winner, the person has to have dropped the three first fetters. And then comes the two uh, that get shaken off. Um, and uh, that's the once returner. And then when these five fall off, then you have an anagami who has now the last or the upper fetters to deal with the set, uh, out of the 10 fetters, Sangyu Ojanas. And when those drop, you have an Arahant. I've mentioned these Sangyu Ojanas in, in different talks. So I, unless there's specific questions about it later on, I will, uh, you know, I won't, uh, I don't want to go over them again uh, because there's a lot more to cover. Um, so in this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of four right efforts. Uh, right effort of the Eightfold Path, if you, it has uh, four branches, uh, you know, when, when we have to um, block, in a sense, uh, eliminate, and we have to uh, develop, and then we have to maintain. So two are directed towards unwholesome actions or behaviors. We have to stop it. So whatever is risen, we have to, um, well, address that. And we have to stop the ones from arising in the first place. Uh, so we have to uproot the negative. And then we introduce, we cultivate new, healthier, wholesome qualities. And then we maintain them. Every time you're sitting to meditate, you are um, hopefully doing these four. Uh, I've gone over the, uh, them several times because when you fall back into complacency and you skip your meditation or you're not focusing on it or you're saying, yeah, it's fine. I'm, I'm only sitting 30 minutes. I'm only sitting one hour. That's enough. But you know that there's more room to go you are not doing the fourth. You're not maintaining that. You're not maintaining the growth of it. You're not rousing a lot more effort to really go to the next level. So uh, to break that state of impassivity or inertia is really what we're after whenever we talk about Sang Vega or the urgency. That's why I say we don't meditate simply to have a nice calm mind. Boo-hoo, you could do that with yoga. You could do that with nice music. Who cares? Ultimately, well, how is this getting me out of delusion of my reliance on my negative habits? Do I have a different perspective on life? Do my narratives change because of my practice? Is my ego as strong as ever? Is my conceit stronger than ever? Now I just have new embellishments called Dhamma on it. I have new titles, but you still find the ugliness inside of me that was always there. So that means the person is not growing in the practice. There's no true insights happening. There's no awakening happening. So the right efforts, I, you know, um, it's no one can under, um, uh, uh, you know, you can't say enough good things about it basically. 
So there are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of the four bases of psychic powers. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. We've addressed this in the um, Idipad of Ibanga Sutta, excuse me, um, I think a month or two ago, where we talked about um, um, the four psychic uh, powers um, or bases of success. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of the five spiritual faculties. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. And five spiritual faculties, sometimes they can work interchangeably with the seven factors of awakening. So I don't want you to be like, you know, getting dizzy headed with all these because Lord Buddha is uh, doing the synapses basically of, of all of what is uh, the, 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 the practice, the type of practice that people have in this group of bhikkhus have been doing in order for them to reach these lofty states. Um, in this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of the five spiritual powers. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. Again, the five spiritual faculties and the five spiritual powers, essentially they are the same things, but they're different levels of uh, maturity in the person. So we start with, um, if you take the five spiritual faculties, for example, we're talking about sadha first. Sadha is the faith, the confidence, the trust that arises in the practitioner. Then we have, some people say, um, effort or energy first. Uh, you know, you have to then bring more of that in order for you to maintain sati, which is the third. Then you have samadhi, which is the concentration or collectedness of mind, the way I like to translate it. And because of these four, you have panya, which is wisdom or discernment taking place. So if you arrange it in a certain way, they also reflect the seven factors of awakening. So they work interchangeably. But uh, again, the powerful ingredient of these uh, is always gonna be sati. Because of sati, everything else comes into view. Now, when the person is practicing these day and night, the five spiritual faculties, they turn into maturity and they become ripe, meaning they become powers. The same. So you have a really advanced uh, level of samadhi. So that's when we call that the spiritual uh, uh, faculty that has turned into power. Uh, just like in the case of, for example, joy or PT, when we're talking about the seven factors of awakening, that is not mundane joy. That is the highest form of joy that a human or a being could experience. It's the sublimest, if you call it like that, uh, form of it. So, uh, these are not mundane states that Lord Buddha is talking about. Um, worldly uh, things that, uh, you know, like faith I mentioned. It's not a mundane type of faith, you know. Um, everything is related to the practice. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of the seven factors of awakening, Satta Bhajanga. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. So earlier, if you recall, I mentioned uh, this sutta talks about the seven sets, seven sets, the formulas of the seven sets. What these seven sets are is what we just went over. Basically, they are the bodhipakkiyas, which in Pali, which are the 37 limbs or aids to awakening, the supports, the, the 37, um, because they help. The practice is not going to take us in a smooth ride. Oftentimes we're going to deal with some heavy, heavy sankharas, heavy uh, ignorance-based uh, factors, habitual tendencies, 
that we might find ourselves, we will actually find ourselves lost at times. So these become aids uh, for us to redirect uh, ourselves in the proper way, find our bearings, look and find out where we are on the map of our progress. If we're going backwards or if we're really going forward, because we can't stay stationary. There's always movement necessary, either backwards or forward. So the question might come up, well, Bante, do we have to do all 37? I mean, you're just throwing numbers at us and this is mind boggling. Which one am I going to remember? Just if you can remember only one set, that's already a lot. But even how we're going to see the sutta unfold, even going over these 37 is not going to be necessary. Uh, when you look at the breath and how you can really um, take the breath with you everywhere, because we're going to see as we practice the anapanasati, the in and out breathing, you already are practicing the 37 aids to enlightenment, which is wonderful. <laughs> makes the job a lot easier. Uh, so, so just to go over the seven sets, so we have the four satipatthanas, we have the four right efforts, uh, we have the four bases of uh, psychic power or spiritual success, we have the pancha indriya, which are the five uh, faculties, spiritual faculties, we have the five uh, pancha bala, or uh, the, the five powers, um, um, Bala, I'm sorry. Um, and then we have the um, Satta Bojangas, which are the seven factors of awakening. And then we have the Atangika Magga, which is the eightfold, noble eightfold path, making up the 37. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to undermine them either. Whenever we are able to spend time on them, Lord Buddha always encourages us to cultivate them, to ponder them, to meditate on them, to, to always have them in our hearts as best as we can. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of loving kindness. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. Aha! So now we're talking about the Brahma Viharas. So you are getting basically <laughs> not to uh, trivialize or present a grotesque image in any way, shape or form, but when Lord Buddha is breaking this down as to who the gathering is made up of, you're also seeing the spiritual resumes of each of these meditating arahants or noble disciples. What I mean by that is the techniques by which they had attained to those lofty states. So we saw how the bodhipakkhyas were practiced, or at least portions of it, by different individuals. Lord Buddha is not going to point, point out saying, oh, Anruddha did this and then did this. No. Other suttas you might find him mentioning in some cases with some bhikkhus. But in this case, he's giving you the rundown of, okay, there's also bhikkhus who have practiced the Brahma Viharas. And he will point out, starting with Metta and then Karuna and then Mudita and then Upekka. And then eventually we're going to see how it trickles down to those bhikkhus who've been practicing breathing, mindfulness of breathing, in and out breathing. So this is where this is leading. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of compassion, Karuna. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of altruistic joy, mudita. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of equanimity. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. In this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of seeing the repulsive. There are indeed such bhikkhus here in this practice in this gathering. Here move, we're moving away from the Brahma Viharas into practicing meditation or contemplation on the Asubha or Patikula or looking at the loathsome or the repulsive 
aspect of things. So um, for some of you that might not know this or about this, it's basically looking at something that is, for example, unrepulsive, meaning it's not disgusting, in fact, beautiful or uh, lovely, delightful to taste, uh, to touch, to any of the six senses. But you're looking and seeing the repulsive side of it. So even if you're looking at the most delicious, your favorite most food dish, you're seeing how it's going to come out of your body later on. That's what you're seeing in the plate. So you're seeing the worst of the food. You're not being mesmerized. Oh, look at, smell that fragrance of the food. No, you're smelling how it will smell like several hours later or a few days later. So the same thing with the body. Looking at the other person or somebody very attractive or even yourself. Uh, seeing the repulsive of that. And then you're looking at the 32 parts of your body and it's like, wow, going from your head hairs down to the, your toes, to the most, most basic part of the body. Unfortunately, I see sometimes even bhikkhus uh, and in some cases nuns today uh, beautifying themselves whether by building muscle I've seen this and it was quite distressing for me because I have been a trainer in fitness now I'm a bhikkhu and I see sometimes pictures of bhikkhus in the, on the web or even personally seen them in my travels where you know this person is trying to improve their physique, building upper body strength, shoulder, you know, their pecs, everything, or taking specific shots, camera angles where they show their physique. What is this? Or nuns that do their eyebrows or, you know, wear beautiful scarves in the same color as their robes. What is this? This is nonsense. This actually goes against the vinaya even if there's no specific rules. How is this helping your progress? How is this you seeing the repulsive? This skin is just repulsive. If you look at it with an electron microscope, how can this be beautiful and all that? So there are bhikkhus there who practice seeing the asubha, the repulsive. And it can really take a person deep uh, in their practice. Uh, again, many teachers uh, advise that this be practiced by monastics, um, but Lord Buddha taught it for everyone. Uh, so I leave that to the person. Um, in this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of seeing impermanence. Uh, and uh, so there are indeed such bhikkhus here in this gathering. So. Um, that's kind of self-explanatory. Of course, we're going to cover more of that. Um, so in essence, we are getting a, a rundown at, or a very short description of what the Dhamma is that Lord Buddha has been teaching. And what if we had a glimpse to the surrounding, uh, the gathering itself, we see that the group, the gathering, is itself the embodiment of the Dhamma. They have been putting it into practice. That's what Lord Buddha is saying. That's how I see it. Because here now he's mentioning about anicca, impermanence, which is the key purpose of doing the Satipatthana. We're going to see how in the fourth tetrads, we're going to get into uh, 13, 14, 15, 16. So starting from uh, the 13th step of the Anapanasati, we're going to get into the impermanence, seeing of impermanence from the breath, because that is the closest indicator, the biggest evidence, if you will, of seeing impermanence, because we cannot see when our skin is getting, excuse me, older, when you're seeing liver spots, things like that, when it used to be like a child's little hand. Now it's huge and it's getting old, veins showing up and all kinds of things. Uh, we don't see that in a, you know, a quicker fashion. 
but the breath is louder when it comes to showing us the presence of impermanence and how it's happening constantly so it is uh, revealing or betraying impermanence to us so it's showing us that everything is impermanent so we can just uh, jump into it very quickly into understanding the three characteristics of existence because the person who experiences impermanence is a person who's also experiencing dukkha suffering because you cannot have impermanence so long as there is a mindful awareness of it uh, and not feel the pain associated with impermanence because the things that you love are slipping through your fingers that is painful and because of this process taking place completely uh, without your control is also taking us into anatta, which is the third characteristic, so a characteristic of existence. So we're, the person who is practicing anapanasati, as we'll see, will get to a point where they are tasting the three characteristics uh, with every single breath coming in, with every single breath going out. And he continues, um, in this gathering, there are bhikkhus who are yoked and committed to the practice of mindfulness on the in and out breathing. Aha, now we're getting to the main crux of the sutta. Uh, although many techniques you saw being mentioned here, Lord Buddha here pauses, takes his time, to unravel one of the techniques, specifically the anapanasati, the in and out breathing. Because um, um, commentaries have also agreed with this. Um, the, um, the understanding was that majority of the bhikkhus were practicing the in and out breathing. That's why Lord Buddha focuses mostly on, only actually, on uh, unraveling, going deep into this particular technique, instead of, let's say, loving kindness, instead of uh, the patikula or the asuba, repulsive contemplation, etc. cetera. Uh, by the way, anapana, uh, just to give you uh, the etymology of it, uh, the word structure, um, ana is the inhalation and apana is the um, the exhalation uh, of it in Pali. In Sanskrit, it would be prana. Prana is also uh, breath. It's, it has several different definitions, but usually it's uh, breath or life. Um, and uh, But in Pali, we have ana, apana. And the verb that is used is asasati. Asasati, and it's being used in the in Pali. It's being used mostly in the in the future tense. Asasisami, pasasisami, breathing in or inhalation and breathing out, exhalation. So, bhikkhus, here's he begins. When mindfulness on the in and out breathing is continuously developed and cultivated intently, it brings with it many benefits and great results. When mindfulness on the in and out breathing is continuously developed and cultivated intently, it also addresses and fulfills the objectives of the four establishments of mindfulness. When the four establishments of mindfulness, satipatthana, mindfulness are continuously developed and cultivated intently, they fulfill the objectives of the seven factors of awakening. And when the seven factors of awakening are continuously developed and cultivated intently, they fulfill the objective of true knowledge and of release, vidya and vimutti. So uh, even though we are talking about the in and out breathing, the anapanasati, but because the connection that Lord Buddha makes uh, between this sutta, this technique and satipatthana, we see a perfect match with the first stage of the Kāyānupassana that we find in the Satipatthana, the four establishments of mindfulness, like I mentioned earlier, Kāya, 
Kaya Nupasana means the body awareness, the body, the posture of the body, looking at the body. Um, and specifically, uh, mostly rather, uh, it addresses the breathing portion, the in and out breathing. Um, in the future, I also want to cover, obviously, the Satipatthana uh, Sutta separately, where I can dedicate more time to it and, uh, and give it you know, the fair treatment um, instead of going in and out like this. But I just wanted to draw the similarities and the importance of the factors in, in between the two. Um, uh, so, but in the Satipatthana, we don't stay with the body. We, we, we delve into the feelings and we delve into the mind and, and, uh, um, and the dhammas uh, and uh, factors and uh, mind objects. But interestingly enough, also, because of Lord Buddha's mentioning how this uh, technique also fulfills the, uh, the requirements and the purpose of the Satipatthana, we also are going to see him describing the Anapanasati in terms of Satipatthana later on. So I just love Lord Buddha's teachings because he's the most exquisite, the most sublime, the perfect, perfect teacher I've ever come across. And because he's looking at everything, every aspect and trying to give the teaching in, in, in morsels that are easily ingestible. Uh, so I, so I'm just reminded of one of uh, uh, the greatest minds of mathematics of the 20th century, uh, uh, Friedman, uh, I forgot his first name, Alan, I think Friedman, uh, he was from Caltech, I think he was also a Nobel Prize winner, I think, but one time uh, his students would ask him because he was very dynamic, engaged in giving his talks and in, in explanations in his classes. Uh, but he would explain it in this way. He's like, no matter how many concepts and theorems and mathematical equations and solutions you have in your mind, higher physics, higher calculus, all these things. He says, if you're not able to explain that to your grandmother, in simple terms, then you don't know nothing. So Lord Buddha was known not just because of the vastness, limitless and, and uh, beyond a level of, 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 of knowledge and wisdom that he possessed, but also in his ability to present the right teaching in the most appropriate and useful manner to get even the most illiterate, uneducated person on the street to be an arahant. Wow. So you see this. So, uh, and anapanasati is the perfect example of that. If a person can just do anapana, that's it. Just observe the breath. All of the Dhamma is going to re re be revealed to them, basically. And uh, so, uh, so now he's, he's, he's uh, uh, you know, let's let's go back to this. And how? Because is mindfulness and the in and out breathing continuously developed and cultivated intently? Here, the bhikkhu, by going to the forest or sitting at the root of a tree or in an empty kuti or a hut, folds his legs together, keeping his body straight and brings his awareness inwards and rests it upon the breath flowing in and out. Thus, he mindfully breathes in and mindfully breathes out. There's been a confusion about the breath and the location of where the attention has to be. You had many books written, all of them post-canonical, meaning they don't fall into the actual teachings. They were added later. You had the uh, Vimutti Magga, Visuddhi Magga, and then you had the uh, uh, all these things were later added, but they go into details, but they are not the teachings of Lord Buddha. They are just the expressions of meditators or usually commentators. Unfortunately, you had over the course of centuries, entire traditions based on the commentaries. That's why I am of the camp who likes to go back to the suttas. And that's why I want to 
dedicate so much of my life to bringing the suttas to all of us so we can see the wonders and the fullness of the teachings there you don't have to rely on the commentaries even though they do offer some good things sometimes underlined sometimes <laughs> so it's not about location i mentioned this because I once was at a retreat and um, I had just about gone and reached this place and the it was many years ago and there was this bhikkhu young bhikkhu and who was going to be the teacher uh, for that retreat and he was asking about our meditation experience and at that time I had been doing breath meditation um, and I, he said, so you need to watch the abdomen. And I said, no, Bhante, I watch the nose. I mean, that's how I'm used to it. And he's categorically said, well, I can't help you then. And I, I said, I'm sorry, like, why? He says, because this is the Mahasi method and we only watch the abdomen. If you're not gonna watch the abdomen, then please leave, which I found very uh, strange. So, um, <laughs> so I was, I was very stubborn in those days uh, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> I left because of the treatment that uh, was there because I didn't find it to go in, in meshed with, nicely with the teachings of the Dhamma. But you have such staunch positions sometimes, unfortunately. Who cares about the location? Because Lord Buddha, nowhere in the sutta or anywhere in the suttas will you find him saying, focus on the breath around the nostrils. The word is parimukha in Pali. Parimukha. Parimukha means several things. One of them is establishing mindfulness in front of you. You can say it like that in English. It's also, um, it, it means around the opening. It doesn't say which opening. <laughs> so if you take it literally. So it doesn't give us a specific physical place. Now I know I'm dedicating some time to this because there are to this day people who advocate on the breath being in this location that you need to focus on. If a student I, uh, comes to me and, and I see them being much more suited to the breath, usually I encourage them to focus in the area around their nostrils, but that doesn't mean that that's the only way. I give you know, images or metaphors. I say, for example, make a small chair, armchair, and sit like an, on a very comfy, comfy sofa and sit right there and watch the breath going in and going out, for example. You're not gonna find any of that in the suttas just that it has been working for a lot of people. Uh, another one, I mentioned this recently, and one student was very moved by how simple it was, the instruction on the breath. And, and that involves just listening to the breath. If it's in a quiet environment, just observing the breath coming in, just through the, vo the sound of it. Who cares about the lo location? So, uh, so uh, stay away from only the word when you see only, you're only supposed to put the attention there type of a thing. Uh, when we're talking about the physical uh, location that is. So let's jump now into the first tetrad, the first uh, steps. While breathing in long, he knows I breathe in long. Breathing out long, he knows I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he knows I breathe in short. Breathing out short, he knows I breathe out short. Rarely are you going to find the breath from one breath to the next, one full inhalation, exhalation to the next, to be the same in length, in duration depending on what state you're in. You might see something, you might remember something, all of a sudden your heart races. When your heart is racing now, you need to be squeezing more oxygen through your lungs, which necessitates more breathing. So now we're getting even shallower breathing 
or sometimes your nervous system rests, calms down. Now we have more longer and longer and longer breaths happening. Uh, this is different than let's say in pranayama or in yoga where there is control of the breath. Many people think that they're the same thing, they're not. And um, this is not about control. So I need to emphasize that because sometimes I have heard and seen people do uh, forcefully uh, directing the breath to behave in a certain way. That would be doing pranayama, which is not anapanasati. Sati means mindfulness. So you're watching, you're mindful of the in and out breathing. That's it. So Lord Buddha is now uh, trying to simplify it. So he's saying sometimes you're going to find the breath being short. So when it is short and you're aware of it, just know, just know that it is short. I mean, it's not complicated. Just know right now you're sitting let's say you can can you feel your feet okay you know your your position of your feet then that's it can you know your breath okay so the same way knowing whether it's short whether it's long and in poly the for these two steps that i just went over uh, the word is pajanati, to know, to know. These are the two steps where you will find Lord Buddha mentioning this verb, pajanati. From then on, it will turn into training, sikkhati, sikkhati. Just like we do when we take the five precepts, uh, sikkha padang pajani, uh, um, <laughs> My brain just stopped. When you're taking the, let's say, the five precepts to uh, abstain, practicing the training rule to abstain from harming living beings, you're using the, the verb sikkati. So that we don't see here with these two steps. We see instead pajanati, which we also see in satipatthanas, by the way, all throughout. So uh, so I, I needed you to, to become aware that he's already establishing that there's no control here being applied to the breath to kind of squeeze it, to elongate it or stretch it out, etc. cetera. So, um, so we're establishing the mindfulness of the breath in such a way where we are keeping an eye on it. Earlier I said, listening to its sound um, as we really know really really know and get to know the breath instead of like nitpicking where is it you know where is it taking place etc so there's no manipulation at all uh, so now we get to the third step and he, this is where it gets into training so and he starts by training himself with the breath further, sikkati, uh, with the breath further, he pays attention to the whole breath. Aha, whole breath. Uh, from beginning to end. And some translators call it uh, the whole body. Some called it the whole body of the breath. Some called it the whole body and left it at that and looked at the actual physical body. Uh, as he experiences it flowing inward. Training further, he pays attention to the whole breath from beginning to end as he experiences it flowing outward. So by uh, training, um, Sikha, and we, we have this term in the Pali, which is Patisam Vedi, which is fully experiencing something, fully feeling Patisam Vedi Vedana, for example, it's fully feeling, experiencing something uh, in completeness. Uh, when I say body, let's say, your body, and you go ahead and scan it, let's say, scan your body for me. Do you consider your body to be, let's say, if it's lengthwise, from your head down to your knees? 
or to your ankles or to your waist? Or do you take the whole body in, like from the, tops, the top of your head all the way down to the bottom of your feet? That would be the whole body. So the same way, what Lord Buddha is saying is the way I understand it, of course, uh, starting with the breath from the beginning, stretching all the way to the middle, and then all the way to the very last portion of the inhalation or the exhalation. The whole body of the breath, just like in your case, your body also includes going up from the bottom of your feet, not stopping at your neck. You don't want to leave the head out, but the, everything. So that is what is being uh, encouraged here. The entire length of the breath uh, or the entire body, uh, the term in Pali is sabbakaya. Sabba means all, kaya means body. So, uh, uh, so from okay, so the next is further while breathing in, he settles down the breath's movement within the physical body. While breathing out, too, he settles down the breath's movement within the body. I use the words uh, settle down, some people use calming, some people call it. Uh, I don't know, there's so many terms that I've come across, but basically here we are addressing the Kaya Sankara. The Sankara is one of those trickiest Pali words that is so hard to translate. Uh, translators have used um, formations, volitional formations, uh, fermentations, uh, preparations. I it, none of these have, have appealed to me because I look at it experientially and it has to feel right. Uh, and, and I need to wrap my mind, my experience, my right brain basically doesn't understand these words. So uh, for me, it has to do with experience. So Sankara, when you look in the suttas and, uh, and you see how Lord Buddha or his Arya Savakas are describing it, they break down the sankharas into three. Uh, uh, kaya sankara, vachi sankara, and mano sankara. The mind, uh, speech, or vo verbal, and then the body, basic. So when it comes to the body sankharas, to break it down, they always, or Lord Buddha himself, would always address the in and out breathing as it. That's how the body is recognized. That's how body is given life, even. So uh, Sankara, uh, just for reference, um, I use the, the term generative causes, uh, um, habitual patterns, let's say, sometimes fit in, but it's very contextual. It has to be taken that into consideration. So. In this case, the Kaya Sankara are specifically talking about the in and out breathing uh, taking place within the physical body. So then the person at this stage is calming down the breath because you've moved from short, okay, I see you short breath. Okay, I see you long, I see that, okay. Meanwhile, the breath, the mind is calming down slowly, slowly, slowly. And then you're aware of the breath because you're, the turbulence is less and less. The hindrances are stopping slowly, slowly, because ultimately we're going in the second tetrad, for example, we're going to get into the jhanas. Not in those words, but definitely we're going to see the outcome of the jhanas. So you're preparing the mind by removing the nivarana or the hindrances. You cannot do that if the mind is like this, shaky. So as the fourth step of the first uh, tetrad, or the, the four lines, if you will, we see how Lord Buddha, now that we've seen the beginning, middle, and end of the breath, now we can look at the body and say, okay, go ahead and rest breath. We can become more and more accepting of the breath, and it's more comfortable, and it's more there is more of a sense of safety in the body. So your heart is not racing. Your breathing is not shallow. Huh. You're almost like 
a baby again in the arms of your mother or someone so loving and you're so secure you got nothing to be afraid of at that moment the breath calms down on its own so nowhere are you going to find anything here in these 16 steps by the way where you are forcefully doing something the people who run into problems with the anapanasati technique or sutta are the ones who are bringing their own gung-ho attitude, like I'm going to control, I'm going to direct them, they will never even get to the first stage properly of you know watching the short breath because they're too fixated on, I want things to be a certain way. So there's a lot of letting go and watching and observing taking place here. There's a very much of a permission or allowance uh, in the in the practice. So continuing on. Training himself further while breathing in, he is sensitive to experiencing joy. Oh. And while breathing out, too, he remains sensitive to experiencing joy. The word in for I use the word joy to describe it. Um, but in Pali, the term is PT. PT that we see also in the Seven Factors of Awakening, for example, uh, among other places. But PT, PT is the result of uh, this. This joy is not usual joy that you find in life. This is the jhanic joy, which is taking place because of a mind that is unremitting. It is relentless. It is on the breath in this case. It doesn't let go of the breath and come back and go and think about groceries or think about world situation, this and that, or get angry, this and that, and think about your relationships and then feel some coziness or joy. It's like, yeah, that's no, that's not the joy we're talking about here. Because starting with the uh, fifth step and on, we're talking about the jhanas up until the eighth step, that is. So we're talking about, uh, especially the feeling tonality, the feeling tonality of, of how it is. And when, so basically this is, we're talking specifically, we're talking about the first jhana and the second jhana at this level, because the first jhana is where the joy is really intense, comes in, it's unprecedented. It's never the kind of joy that you've ever had in your life, normal life. And then it becomes more refined. There's a pleasantness about it because now the other aspects of the Brahma Viharas, if you will, or the Jhanic factors come in. It's because there's now a little bit of a nuance of Upekka there also. And the mind is becoming more and more and more and more united, collected. In this case, ekagata, coming together. Eka means one, got, agata means come, agacha. So it's coming together. So it's not too shaky, but it's still got some joy in the, in, the, in the second jhana. But as we go, we'll see how it's becoming more refined. So training himself further while breathing in, he is sensitive to experiencing gladness. And while breathing out, too, he remains sensitive to experiencing gladness. Gladness is now we're going closer to tranquility. After a person experiences the jhanic uh, joy, uh, however long it lasts, it is going to be followed always with the sense of tranquility. It settles. It settles. It's like when the snow is falling and it's so joyful and then finally it stops and then you look outside the window and the snow is just powder outside. It's so fluffy, it's so perfect, especially if no one stepped on it. So there is that sense of tranquility now. Settle, settle, settle. Which prepares the mind to now observe the other factors of uh, the other aspects of the sankaras, I mean. And uh, so he goes, training himself further. While breathing in, he becomes sensitive to his thoughts and feelings. Ah. 
And while breathing out too, he becomes sensitive to his thoughts and feelings. So here in the second tetrad, we see the more of the, the feeling aspect of, well, using the Satipatthana. Uh, as we're going to see later also, Lord Buddha is going to break down these four tetrads into the four Satipatthanas. So because we're talking about the second tetrad, we're talking about the, uh, the feeling aspect of Satipatthana, which is Vedananupassana the mindfulness of feeling as an establishment to focus on the nature of the feelings, including the thoughts, the quality of the thoughts. Now, of course, at this point, uh, a person might say, well, you can't be using any vitakka and vichara because these are the two factors that you find in the first jhana, but not in the second jhana which is, you know, thinking and pondering. Vitakka is thinking. It's directed thought. Pondering is even more directed and dedicated. So that's not what we are talking about here because you're going deeper because you're, there is no verbal or sub-vocal communication in your mind. You're not listing names. You're not thinking about things that and this is important to be mindful of because, as I was mentioning earlier, the steps that we're going through, they're not to be done analytically. Okay, am I checking off this box? Okay, I checked this box. Okay, now I'm going into the second tetrad. No, no, that's too left brain. We don't do that. That's too analytical, too intellectual, too directive, forceful. So instead, we look at this in a different way. We're looking at it as an unfolding, a process of unfolding. If you look at a lotus or a rose as it's opening its petals, you can't force the petals to open. My grandmother used to have a balcony. Uh, we have had a balcony and she would plant carnations and roses and things, gardenias. And sometimes when I was a kid, I would be so mesmerized by the smell, the fragrance of it. Sometimes I would tear open, I was, I was a child, tear open the carnation flower to force it to open up. I would feel so ter terrible afterwards because nor, neither the smell nor the petals would be in, you know, <laughs> ready. So the same thing, when the lotus is opening up, the hours most petals open up, and when they're opening up, they make room for the other petals to open up. But first, the others, the, the ones, that's why the same in the beginning, short breath, long breath, the whole body of the breath, relaxing the kaya, sankara, all these things. So now we're in the second tetrad. So the mind is still ah, finding comfort. We're opening. So no directive action here. I don't know if that my camera is smudgy or anything. So if I am, I'm sorry. So for, okay. All right. So uh, next. So we're now on the eighth step, training himself further while breathing in. He quiets down his thoughts and feelings, bringing them to complete stillness. Any kind of turbulence that was there. Now he scans his mind and settles. So now he's addressing the nivarana, the hindrances even more, because sometimes you're going to find the hindrances getting more subtle, subtle, subtle. They're not as gross. It might not be an anger that you might have had towards your friend or somebody so loud anger in yourself or rage, but now it can become more resentment, maybe, towards you, towards the practice, feeling like you're not good enough, or you're doing the practice wrong, which is also vichikicca, which is the doubt, hindrance of doubt. So they might have taken very subtle flavors. So you're looking and you're observing what is taking place without analyzing, but you're just seeing. When you turn on the light, the darkness disappears. That's what's happening. I'm going to turn the angle of the camera to see if I can change the glare. I don't know if this is 
Okay. All right. So let's try that. Okay. Uh, so why are we doing this so far? To gain more insight. To what? Well, to what is taking place in the mind. The Dhamma has to happen within us. Nibbana happens within us, not outside. But if we don't know what's going on inside in, in our world, Nibbana can never take place. No one's going to give you a certificate and, and call, you know, recognize you and, oh, now you're an Arahant. Okay, now you can go ahead and have students or, you know, claim yourself to be the next, I don't know, guru or something. There's no such thing. So the understanding comes from you having understood the inner workings of your heart, your mind. But that cannot take place if we don't know where the breath is, for starters. We need to know, we need to understand, we need to probe. So there's a penetration, the penetrative insight we talk about a lot. So here we're seeing from tetrad to tetrad, from step to step, the baton is being passed. As runners on the field, they pass they, the baton to the next runner to take the next uh, portion of the race to the next level. So, uh, so we need to expand the practice of the breath into the level of satipatthana, if you will, because we need to pierce into uh, what is happening, because the breath is a very good spy. It's a very good agent. It's a very good marker that tells us of what is happening. Um, in the field of therapy, whenever I would be with, with clients and I would ask something or say something, and all of a sudden I would see them get their hand in front of their chest or close their throat, or, and then pretend that they're scratching, or they hold their breath, or they go like, and no, everything else is normal. I stop the therapy right there and I say, what was that? What, what was that? Or they go, they take a deep breath like this. All of a sudden, they just, I'm saying something. <sighs> they do that. That is not insignificant. That is very significant. I say, what happened there? Tell me. They say, I don't know. I said, please. I said this, but then all of a sudden, your body did that. And then normally I would see them starting to tear up. The eyes get watery. I see them happy when they were sad looking. And they say many, many revealing things. What happened? The breath, in one case, it got held up, braced, because let's say, I say, okay, the next time you go to work and you see your supervisor or your employer and they go, I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course. The breath stops. When do we stop the breath? When we are getting ready for an impact, when somebody is coming to hit us, we're holding it in. The breath is a marker that let us know that the mind is not feeling safe. And again, in the other example, when the breath goes, <sighs> What is that? I just took in more flow of, of, of oxygen into the brain, into the body. My muscles, my cells are just like, oh, yes. Why? Because the person is feeling safe. Let's say I say, oh, it's Friday. Or let's say next Friday. Or when you get to your uh, you know, vacation time or holiday or your favorite bed, you finally made home and you're lying down on your bed. They go, oh, after a very difficult day or week. So the breath is always there to inform us of what's going on. Now, the problem is we are not there to greet it. We are not there to see what's going on. 
Lord Buddha always knew where the breath is. is. And in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, Lord Buddha talks about when a person is practicing the Satipatthanas. Uh, he starts with seven years, by the way. He says, if a person does it for seven years, then the person either is going to be an arahant or at the very least an anagami, a non-returner. Not a bad deal. But he doesn't stop at seventh year. He says in six years, even five years, he says even four, three, two, and you, you guessed it, he's going down. Even if a person practices for, for six months, he says, no, forget about six months, five months, four, three, two, one. Even, he says, half a month. No, forget about half a month even. He says, even for one week, one week, you can either become an arahant or a, an, ar a, an anagami. So that same message is playing throughout the anapanasati. So I, I would encourage you to approach it. But the mindfulness of the breath has to be there. So I would like this not to just be another sutta exploration per se or studying of a sutta to kind of get the background story, this and that, or another data, list of data to add it. No. But to approach your own breath as a new relationship. Wherever you go, Make sure you're holding the hand of your breath gently, carefully, though. In uh, some years ago, I was uh, when I was doing my dissertation on, uh, I had picked the topic of the 10 ox herding pictures from the Zen tradition, um, and which comes from the early suttas, by the way. Uh, we see them in different places. And uh, the person is first looking for the traces of the ox, the bull, and there's no trace. And But he knows, the herder, the ox herder, knows that the ox is somewhere. He has the faith. Something is not sitting well with him. He knows. Ah, where's the ox? I know there's an ox. I know I will find him somehow, but he cannot find the ox first. He will find, all of a sudden, looking down, moves the high grass and tall grass, and he sees, he sees in the wet mud, the traces, the hoof prints of the ox. And he says, aha, so there is an ox. There is an, ah, okay. So now, even though he doesn't see the ox, but he has seen the traces of the ox. So he now knows what to look for. So he walks and he goes to more fresh, fresher and fresher traces of the footprint or hoof prints. And then finally he sees the tail of the ox. And he says, aha! And he approaches and he grabs hold of the tail. He says, ah, I'm not gonna let you. And then eventually, eventually the ox resists this and that. And finally, finally he approaches the body and he doesn't even need to hold its horns, he walks next to it, puts a leash on it, holds it. That's what we're doing with the breath. We first have to find the breath, connect with the breath. And some of the pictures and later on the ox herding uh, pictures, the, the color of the ox changes. It turns from black to white. And then you see the herder is sitting on the ox. He doesn't have to hold anything. Wherever the ox goes, that's where he goes. And it's, it's a lovely series of images uh, that we have in, uh, in, uh, in, in Buddhism. Uh, so let's move on further. Training himself further. Uh, while breathing in, he is sensitive to experiencing the mind. And while breathing out too, he remains sensitive to experiencing the mind. Again, we are not directing anything. We're just, the mind is becoming settled enough for it to turn its gaze to, okay, the mind. In this case now, in the third tetrad, 
we are dealing with the chitta anupassana of the, uh, of the satipatthana, if you notice. We're looking at the mind. Uh, training himself further. While breathing in, he gladdens the mind. Gladdens the mind. Uh, some translators use uh, delights the mind. Uh, I like the word gladdening. Uh, and while breathing out too, he continues gladdening the mind. Uh, training himself further, he breathes in while collecting the mind in samadhi by steadying it. And while breathing out too, he continues collecting the mind in samadhi and steadies it. So now the mind is really, really in deep jhana. So we're now going into, uh, uh, you know, you can even say the fourth jhana. Um, and, and so you, there is more and more of a sense of equanimity taking place, which is the hallmark, the signature of the fourth jhana, by the way. Um, so, um, but there is no Nibbana uh, through the practice of meditation, if there isn't samadhi taking place. The maturity of samadhi has to happen. And samadhi is not just concentration. Remember, it's the collectedness of mind. It's a beautiful word, samadhi. That's why, by the way, it's a term that did not exist. Lord Buddha brought it into the scene. So many of the words of the lexicons that we have oftentimes uh, taken into yoga when the Dhamma disappeared in India, at least they took so many of the terms, including Samadhi, and they applied it into their own philosophies. Of course, by convoluting the meanings to fit that small box that they understood to be that uh, definition of these terms. So, but at least they kept some of these terms even though the Dhamma disappeared. So you find the word Samadhi in different layers of yoga or you know, uh, Raja yoga and things like that. But those are not what Lord Buddha intended when he used the word Samadhi. So later on when Western scholars were translating terms from Pali to English, they used the Sanskrit references that they had already studied in, in yogic traditions and Upanishads and the Vedas, and they use those uh, as definitions for what the Lord Buddha was saying, which is comparing apples and two oranges, basically. So completely different. So samadhi is a collectedness, a stability of mind, where there is concentration, yes, but it is not like uh, concentration at the cost of losing awareness of everything else. No, it encapsulates everything. It's like you're looking at, it might not even be a perfect metaphor for it, but I will try, looking at a very wide, wide, huge expanse that is just white, and there's one single black or blue dot on it. You're aware of the whole thing, including the blue dot. It's a completion. Now you're not getting your nose into the dot. That would be concentration because you would be missing out everything else that's going on. And samadhi in that sense becomes a very necessary criterion for wisdom to take place, which is what we're after, after all, in this, in this Dhamma and discipline. So step 12, training himself further, he breathes in while freeing the mind. We can only free the mind. Basically, again, even the freeing is not like you getting the mind out the door and kicking it, which also is, you know, directive. But we're accommodating, we're just allowing it. First, we collected the mind. And then we are just letting it go. It's like when I was, uh, when I would fly kites with my younger, my older brother, I was just a kid at the rooftops when I was a child. And uh, <laughs> I would hold on to it so tightly because we spent so much time building this kite from scratch. But sometimes if the wind was so 
powerful, it would break the, th the string, the thread. All of a sudden, the tension would just be... And then you would see this kite flying beautifully. The wind would take it far and far away, up and up the clouds. So in this case, we, it, if we use the same analogy, it would be you letting go of the string, liberating the mind, freeing the mind. Uh, it's like that using of that image of the ox herder. It's like him just walking. And there's the image of also in the more advanced images uh, of the 10 ox herding pictures. It, there's a picture of him, the drawing of him walking and the, and the ox is behind him. He's not even holding it. He's, the ox is going wherever the ox herder is. He completely freed the ox. He's no longer attached. He's not even sitting on the ox. So if you take that metaphor further into to see if there's there could be any sort of comparison there, imagery wise. So here we see uh, upekka or equanimity becoming more and more habituated and settled as the mind's um, tranquil state becomes more acceptable to the meditator. This is important because many meditators are shocked when they go deeper into uh, their mind. Even the, the, the basic um, um, feature of the jhanas, let's say the joy, it can be very overwhelming for some of us. And uh, it can be so overwhelming that you think, oh my God, am I, am I going crazy? There's no reason for me to be happy so much. Why am I feeling so happy? And depending on our sankharas or habitual patterns, some of us might even feel guilty for feeling that much joy. There's no reason for me so be to, to be so happy. So the mind gets like this. But with patience and perseverance, when the person is going deeper and deeper and deeper, sometimes when, well, when the person especially is tasting a little bit of upekka, this is long before the fourth jhana happens, sometimes they pull themselves out of it because they don't find themselves worthy of such peace. They're shocked. Basically, they're refusing to accept that there could be such a happy state. For them, they could read about it in the suttas, but when it comes to them, so these are personal, psychological, emotional issues that we have to first, or alongside our practice, uh, deal with. Uh, so for some case, uh, several cases, I've, I've, I've encouraged people to go and see therapists. I highly encourage that for everyone, at least at, for one stage or another in their lives, because sometimes we might have emotional or psychological knots that don't allow us to penetrate deeper because of personal issues, maybe from childhood, from teenage years, or even from early on, from prenatal time when we were in our mother's womb. You know, those, those things are very powerful. So I just want to continue and complete the full, the fourth tetrad, and then I'll pause and ask for questions. Training himself further, now we're in the fourth tetrad. He breathes in while experiencing and watching impermanence. And while breathing out too, he continues experiencing and watching impermanence. So now we are, if we look at it through the, through the glasses of Satipatthana, we are now in the Dhammanupassana, the fourth aspect of the Satipatthana. So we are looking at, in this case, the Arya Suchas or the Four Noble Truths, and specifically in the, in the case of the three suchas or the characteristics or lakkanas, tilakkana, meaning the anicca, we're seeing the impermanence at this point. Suddenly the mind is able to, without thinking about the breath, but you're just observing, because oftentimes at this stage, 
the breath has already vanished. You can't smell, you can't not smell it, but you can't hear it even. There's silence. My encouragement is not to panic. Just maintain, this is a gift. It is there, the breath is there, but it's very subtle, very fine. It's almost like some people describe it in the commentaries like soft, soft, soft cotton. Um, there's other ex explanations also or images, but what I would like for you to think about is just to allow the mind, again, the lotus petals are continuing to open up the image. So suddenly another layer, another petal opens up and it's like, oh, you're seeing the beginning, the middle and the end of things constantly. And this brings up another sensation, another, not sensation per se, but another realization where Lord Buddha calls it viraga or dispassion or a sense of detachment. And that is the one following. So he says, Training himself further, he breathes in while experiencing and seeing detachment or dispassion. Here I use the term that um, Venerable uh, uh, Nyanananda used. Otherwise, uh, many people use fading away or dispassion. But the term in Pali is viraga. Raga means lust, passion. Viraga is the subduing of that. It's like when you extinguish fire. That's what we're talking about. And while breathing out too, he continues experiencing and seeing detachment. So you're even seeing the viraga. You're not just experiencing it, you're also observant of viraga. So training himself further, he breathes in while experiencing cessation. So when you have viraga, then there is the ending of dukkha. There is the ending, whether it's the dukkha of that moment or dukkha in general, uh, meaning the person has attained. And while breathing out too, he continues experiencing cessation. Training himself further, he breathes in while experiencing relinquishment as he keeps giving up. And while breathing out too, he continues experiencing relinquishment as he keeps giving up. So you're constantly in the, in the mode of giving up. The term in Pali, um, I've mentioned it many times, is patinisagga. Patinisagga means relinquishing, giving up. You're giving up everything, just like you give up your breath when you exhale it. You're giving up even the inhalation at the end because you have to give it up. So you're even giving up any of the states that you think, you're not taking anything home with you by saying, ah, oh, I'm experiencing the jhanas, so I'm going to take this, I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to write about this, and then da 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 da, da. There's this, and this comes from the sense of viraga, which also has nibbida, which is disenchantment or renunciation associated with it, or nikkhamma. So we're moving from um, knowing, pajanati, to training, and the training has brought us to uh, the anapanasati, to the level of satipatthana's practice. So wherever we go, we're taking the breath as the tool that allows us to tap into the mind's deeper layers, including through the avenue of the jhanas, and even deeper into deep realizations of vidya and vimutti, the full direct uh, understanding and realization and full liberation. So uh, therefore, because when mindfulness of the in and out breathing is continuously developed and cultivated intently in this manner, then it truly brings with it many benefits and great results. So in this way, we are engaging with in the mindfulness of the breath, not in the forgetfulness of the breath. So your practice is about the mindfulness of the breath, not forgetfulness. Unfortunately, we're mostly on the second camp. We're forgetful of the breath. But nobody starts being mindful all along. So there's, there will be gaps. 
So our job is to fill those gaps whenever we are aware of them. And that's why we practice sati. So I will pause here and next week we will continue from the other uh, uh, um, portion of the sutta. And uh, so uh, I hope this was uh, uh, enough to, to whet your appetite as it were. And here I would like to uh, address any questions or comments you might have uh, about the sutta or the practice or you know, things relevant with the practice. So I appreciate it or the, or the sutta. Dante, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just have a question, which I think is more uh, simply about translating and different words people use, different translations people use for the same word. Uh, I've always associated the word liberation with nibbana, and uh, I see liberation is used here, and cessation is also used here. Uh, and so I'm trying to, I've also associated cessation with reaching nibbana, although I understand through the jhanas we can reach cessation several times before we become an arahant. So I'm just wondering if you can clarify for me the distinction between vimuti and niroda as it pertains to you know the stages of the path and path and what's the difference between them vimuti vimuti is not nibbana is it yes it is uh, did you have a follow-up or i just the booty isn't nibbana is it i didn't hear what you said after that yes can you hear me yes no oh. yeah it's it's oftentimes it's uh uh, used as a reference for Nibbana uh, okay. or, or uh, sometimes it's called uh, Niroda itself is also synonymously used with Nibbana. Niroda is, uh, I had uh, one uh, a person uh, saying how it is similar to Niroda means uh, one of the translations is uh, no longer in prison. So another word for it then would be release. That's another uh, version of it. Vimukti in Sanskrit would be vimukti or moksha or uh, in Sanskrit they would use. Um, but as far as uh, cessation, it's also, you know, um, is also used as nirodha um, and which is the third of the noble truths. So what is ceasing? Ceasing of what? We're talking about ceasing of dukkha, and the causes for dukkha from arising, which takes us again to paticca samuppada. So if there's no suffering, well, everything else stops. There's no, there isn't that chain of events or chain reaction taking place. However, depending on the context, sometimes the cessation or uh, the niroda is is seen uh, as well especially when you get to the cessation of, um, of of feeling and perception for example uh which is a state that is uh as we've seen in in, in uh, sutras before in the in, in our studies here um uh, and in the old suttas uh, that these are that is a state that is uh, achievable or attained by an anagami or an arahant those two. Um, so it is a state where it's, it's, it's the ninth jhana, if you will. It is a state that was not uh, available at the time of the Buddha, uh, at the time of Siddhartha Gautama. And when there is no more Dhamma teachings available, you might find the eight jhanas if you're lucky, uh, which was the case with Siddhartha. But the ninth, which is the cessation of perception and feeling, does not, that is introduced by Lord Buddha. The Buddha has to introduce it just like he would introduce the four uh, noble truths. Now, uh, by the way, so how, how is this so far? I think what I hear you saying is they really, depending on context, can be used interchangeably. If, yeah, so you can use either word in, in when you're talking about 
uh, the final goal of Buddhism. True. Okay. Uh, that answers my question. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I've seen people talk about Niroda as Nibbana itself. Mm -hmm. um, but if we nitpick, if I nitpick, um, I'm going to say, oh, okay, he's talking about the third noble truth, or he might be, even though he didn't add the other portions of, uh, you know, uh, like cessation of feeling and perception uh, added to that word. Is he talking about the person is, are they talking about cessation of perception and feeling? So I always look at the context in, in, in to, to be fair to the term and to see how this sutta or this conversation even is going. Uh, like in the case of the uh, uh, Mahavedala or Chulavedala suttas where you have the, the series of questions and answers. So when, uh, um, when it is any of the noble disciples or in the case of Visakha and his former wife, now the Arahant Dhammadinna, having the conversation where the former husband who happens to be an Anagami and the former wife who is now a Bhikkhuni who happens to be an Arahant, there's this question and answer going on where Visaka, uh, the former spouse, is asking the Arahant uh, about details about the cessation state. Now he has the quali quali uh, qualifiers or the, 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 the right uh, permit, I guess, to talk about it. He has the right to talk about it because he knows what he's, these states signify. Uh, and how a person can get there. So he wants to, in a way, interestingly enough, test the level of understanding of the uh, Arahant Bhikkhuni uh, Dhammadina. And she gives him these answers and, and they're talking about these, you know, the Niroda state until he reaches his cap. He starts trying to lean into the area of understanding that is only there for an arahant to know. And she just calls him out on it. And he said, she says, uh, you've reached the end of your capacity to understand. And But she says, go ahead and talk to Lord Buddha, ask him if my answers are appropriate or satisfactory or not. And however the Lord Buddha says, whatever he says, you need to remember them that way. And he goes, and Lord Buddha confirms, and he says, had I been in the person that was trying to give you the answers, I would have answered it the same way that the Bhikkhuni uh, Dhammadina gave you. So again, I think I went on a tangent, but the, the Niroda always has to be looked at. The same with, with uh, 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 Mutti, uh, but usually when it comes to Mutti, um, um, or vimukti, vimukti, it's the uh, talking about the nibbanic experience, the release or freedom. Uh, oftentimes, I would use liberation in the past. Now I like the release more because it feels, you know, the way the text, uh, the, the context of it goes. Uh, it's it's it feels right, especially. Uh, especially when they talk about Cheto Vimutti, Akuppa Cheto Vimutti, which is one of the most beautiful phrases I've ever come across. And it was introduced by one of my previous teachers who passed away, uh, Bhante Punnaji. He would describe it, um, that state as unshakable serenity of mind. He wouldn't even call it release. Uh, he would call it serenity. I don't like that serenity there, but unshakability, unshakable release of the heart is how I like to translate it. Um, um, so it's, it's very much morphic depending on how the person reading it, translating it, and the context again is number one. So we need to be on top of looking at the con contextual aspect of things instead of just jumping, pouncing on the, ah, you're using this word, why? 
So if we expand and look at the bigger picture, that's my encouragement. But great question as always. Thank you. Any other any other comments, thoughts, questions? There are several suttas that talk about anapanasati. So it's not just this sutta uh, where we have a good amount of dedicated time being given to elaborating it. Uh, Ichanangala sutta, there's the Ananda sutta, there's uh, so many wonderful suttas that Lord Buddha goes deep into it. And um, I think it was in the Ananda Sutta from the Sangita Nikaya, where Lord Buddha says, because I'm going to spend the rains retreat in the forest. No one is to come and disturb me there. Uh, I'm not accepting any person to come ask me questions. So don't bother. Uh, the only person who's allowed to come daily is the person who's going to bring me food. And uh, he goes and he comes out and he says, uh, after the whole rains retreat, he shares with the students because of course they're like itching to ask questions, you know, this because there's been a holdup of questions. <laughs> they haven't had the chance to go ask Lord Buddha anything. So one of the things that Lord Buddha says, uh, he says, if the followers of other sects come and ask you as to what your teacher, the Tathagata, practiced uh, during those three months, then you should answer them in this manner. You would say the Tathagata was dedicating his time to the practice of Anapanasati. Because he says, that is the home, that is the resident, uh, residence of the noble ones, he says. That is the home, the abode of uh, the liberated ones, uh, spe specifically towards the Buddhas he's referring. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, I like to use imagery, and there's one sutta from, it's called the Beauty Queen. Uh, sutta again from the Sangyutta Nikaya and um, in it Lord Buddha talks about just like the image I shared with you of the ox herder uh, but there was an, uh, an image I shared with you last week of the boy in India who was given the spoon to carry the spoonful of oil around his palace well, the original story I found out was actually coming from the Sangyutta Nikaya, where it's again dealing with oil, but it's not a little boy. So Lord Buddha gives this uh, situation, this scenario. He says, uh, imagine a beauty queen in a town, in a city. She's the most prettiest, the most attractive woman on, on, in that city. Plus she's an excellent dancer. So everybody's gathered, let's say, you know, maybe a Saturday night, a weekend, and everybody's gathered around her and she's dancing this beautiful dance to music. Everybody's mesmerized, looking at her. And then he says, there comes a man who was given this bowl that is filled up to the brim with oil and he's holding it. And he, for some reason, has been punished for doing something horrible. And the punishment is this. He has to walk through the crowd towards the beauty queen who is dancing, who is the center of attention, and return back. So go towards her and come back while he's holding on to this bowl full to the brim with oil without looking at anything else, because the moment he spills a single drop of oil from the bowl, there is this huge man behind him who holds 
this very sharp sword raises it and has it held up like this, waiting for him to spill even a drop. And that sword is going to come down and cut off his head immediately if he spills a single drop. So he better make sure that he's not spilling. Lord Buddha gives this metaphor, this simile, to encourage us to be with the meditation object. In this case, the breath. Can we do that? I mean, imagine a crowd full of noisy, everybody's mesmerized, she's beautiful, she's dancing. Nobody's going to be looking anywhere else, including this man, unless he finds out, oh, oh, there's a sword over me, so I better be careful. Oh, then it's, like, it's his life uh, riding on this. So he is just like, I don't care who is dancing over there. I'm going to carry this. So can we maintain that in our practice with that much sangvega, that much urgency? We need that urgency. Is that... That and uh, Dhamma go hand in hand. Dhamma is not something we read. We have some books and we go to, you know, we check some YouTube videos or go to some lectures when the days come and we do retreats or whatever. And we feel good. And then we go back to our normal lives. When you walk from one room to the next, when you go from your living room to your bathroom, and let's say you were having guests, so you have to put on a mask, you have to put on a face, you have to make them feel comfortable. But once you're in the bathroom, what, what happens? You go, ah, now I can be me. I can let my guard guard down. No. Mindfulness has to be carried with us wherever we go. And that's why I was encouraging you last week as well can you make the determination that when you go to bed the next morning when you wake up that you're going to be aware standing right there at the entrance of your nostril let's say when the first breath is being taken in can you be aware of it at that time from that moment that is you living your life as if there is that sword over your neck because we do have that sword over our neck even though we like to tell ourselves no, but we do, it's called death. We're all guaranteed, guaranteed. No one's gonna get out of this place alive, you know. <laughs> so let's make the most of it. And the breath, you know, I usually would teach the, the, the metta, I've been teaching it for a long time, but the breath, uh, is also, uh, as we see, it's very, very powerful. Uh, and and as, as we'll see also next week. So next week, I won't have us do the meditation. So I will try to finish the Anapana's next portion, even though it's long, but, uh, and there are repetitions, but, uh, you know, if it's being recorded, I might as well do it once and at least it'll be there and for posterity. Any uh, comments, questions before we close? Oh, yes. Let me see a message from, from Matthias. Uh, I'd like to ask how to balance to know, uh, balance or know which of the different practices to focus on. Ah, <laughs> a very good question because what temptation, the, one of the temptations we have is when we read a certain sutta and Lord Buddha is talking about something and it's different technique, let's say, a different uh, practice, we get so excited, we're like, oh, I want to drop everything and do that now. My uh, caution here is for us not to turn into that farmer or that person who was, excuse me, was given the keys to his friend's land, the farm, that had underneath it tons and tons of gold because he was poor and his friend one day was like, I had your, enough of your complaining. Here's the key, go ahead. You have one week to go ahead and dig the ground and get as much gold as you want. And whatever you get out of the ground, it's yours. I won't touch it. 
or one week. And the friend goes and is like, he's always complaining. And then, you know, the other one goes and this one has shovels as, you know, all these things to dig with. A week later, his friend comes back and he's shocked because he sees all the farm covered up in holes. And his friend is sitting there on the porch covered in dirt, mad, upset. And he says, what did you do? He says, you lied to me. He says, why? He says, there's no gold here. He says, there is. That's why I told you. He says, no, there isn't. And I said, he says, how did you dig? He says, yes. What, how deep did you go? Oh, I dig about two feet here, one foot there, three feet here, four foot here, this. He said, if you had dug about five feet or six feet, you would have accessed so much gold, you won't know what to do with it. So sometimes the mind likes to jump from one thing to the next. So for that reason, I highly encourage you to speak with uh, a teacher um, and, who, and, and who can know about what progress you have made so far. And if the, if it, because there's nuances that the teacher will be able to help you with. Um, and because, and all of the teachings that are given, they have to be validated by the suttas, not by what the teacher is thinking to be the case. So we always have, we don't have the Buddha anymore. We have the Dhamma and we have the Vinaya. The Dhamma is also in the Vinaya. There's so many suttas there. We get the term sutta actually from the Vinaya. The term that we use, unfortunately, for discourses in the Nikayas, the suttas, is supposed to be suttanda, by the way, just a side note. But so there's these two things. So your practice needs to be giving you fruits about how deep has the person gone down to find gold or not. Sometimes the person might not be developing as fast given them having reached a certain stage because of what I was saying earlier, like there might be some personal emotional issues that might be holding them back. So openly, candidly talking with a teacher one-on-one -on -one is really going to help to know whether to keep you steadily there or maybe tweak it here and there or to give you completely a new meditation technique that might be best suited. So one of the worst things that people can do is read a book and then start meditating and see, thinking that they will attain Nibbana or even the jhanas by simply following some instructions in a book or on a video. There must be the connection with a teacher at one point, at least, or another, to help the, the guiding process to know sooner or later we have to stop in the in our journey and look around and ask someone on the road on this road that we don't know to help us to see if we are on the right path or not and preferably somebody who has been down that road uh, i i hope i'm able to help you with this answer you think okay Okay, uh, there are times like in the, uh, in the case of Venerable Rahula, uh, Siddhartha's son, Lord Buddha's son, and he would be surrounded by this great collection of teachers. Plus his father is, happens to be the king of the Dhamma. I mean, come on, Lord Buddha is his father. So all he had to do is ask, uh, you know, Venerable Sir, you never addressed his father as, dad but he would always address him as venerable sir but uh the reason why i mentioned venerable rahula is because there is a sutta in the um uh, where uh, lord buddha gives uh venerable rahula uh, uh instruction on watching uh, let's say the the elements um as they unfold meanwhile venerable Sa uh, venerable uh, uh Rahula is walking behind his father with the bowl. They're going on Pindapada. 
And uh, he gets so inspired by the teaching. And he says, who has time right now to go and fetch food? Who cares about food? And he says, you know what? I'm just going to sit under a tree and meditate on the instructions given to me. And afterwards, Venerable uh, Sariputta shows up and he says, Rahula, focus on the breath. So he gives him a different teaching, a different technique. And uh, later on, we see how uh, Lord Buddha ties them both together uh, when Venerable Rahula goes and addresses him in the, in later in the day. But uh, different teachings would give, uh, different teachers would give different tools depending on where the student might be uh, uh, or what stage they're in their practice. So, but a very good question because it comes up a lot. And sometimes I've seen students who uh, on their own decide that, okay, now it's time for me to change the, uh, the object, which is not um, advisable at all. Unless the student has attained at least uh, Sotapanna or Sakadagami stage, uh, I would say. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't recommend them changing it uh, uh, first, uh, without first talking to the teacher, that is. So, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go. go. Thanks very much for the talk, Bhante. Um, I would just like to expand on Greg's comment just now on uh, regarding Niroda, Nibbana, Viraga. Um, it appears to me that uh, Nir Niroda is probably more general, um, which and it doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, Nibbana. Because um, I can recall that uh, in the Paticca Samuppada, on the on the reverse leg of the Paticca Samuppada, you have um, Avijani Rodha, Sankarani Rodho, um, Sankarani. Uh, when Sankarani Rodha, um, you have Vinyana. Uh, Namarupa Salayatang Pasa Niroto, which leads to the uh, the cessation of um, Vinyana, um, uh, no Vedana Tanha Upadan uh, Jati Jarana uh, mm -hmm. Bawa Jati Jarana. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you don't say Avijja Viraga. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Viraga doesn't work, uh, apparently it doesn't work here, is it? Yes, uh, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, uh, but I don't believe you mentioned Viraga. Uh, the question was uh, Niroda, uh, release or, uh, and, and uh, yeah, was that correct? Yes, I, I was uh, looking at the distinction between Niroda and Vimuti, not Viraga. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, both of you, and Upatissa as well, because uh, for that clarification, uh, given the distinctions between uh, Niroda, and yes, it is, uh, like I was trying to say earlier, it, it, it's, uh, yes, uh, sometimes it is interchangeable with Nibbana, but uh, you, uh, not as often as Vimutti or as Nibbana itself. Uh, but because it can fit different contexts that are far less in being sublime as, as, as the ending of, of, of all fires, which uh, even Viraga is not used as Nibbana itself. Viraga is simply one of the steps uh, that if you notice, even we covered this in the earliest suttas, in the Pachalayamana sutta, where uh, Lord uh, Buddha talks about uh, to Venerable Mahamogalana, who was struggling with staying awake in his meditation. And then Lord Buddha also used the term Sabedama uh, Nalang Abhinivesaya, nothing is worth clinging on to. And then as the practice went deeper, um, um, you have the unfolding of these. So there is the realization of understanding, direct understanding of impermanence 
thoughts arise, feelings arise, perceptions arise, they have a midpoint, if you will, and then they vanish. So seeing these one after another means you're seeing impermanence, but you see this enough times, you become bored of it, you can become disgusted of it. And that's another term that some people use for dispassion or viraga. So that disgust, that sense of like, ah, again, again, it loses the thing that you had passion towards all of a sudden loses its attractive, attractive force. It no longer sounds beautiful, that opera, that piece of music that you used to listen to, or that most delicious uh, pastry you used to eat or whatever. Who cares, you would say, ultimately, because it's passing, it's passing, it's passing. So as this continues, the thing doesn't land on you. The dust doesn't settle on the table because there's no table for it to rest upon. That is Niroda. That is the cessation, the way I understand it. So there's nothing to land upon. Now, this is happening even before the person truly experiences Vimutti. But you're getting really, really, really close. And as this progresses, as this is going, you're still taking part in life. Things are happening, but whatever comes up, like uh, we've covered before, Adana patini saga, you take up only to give up. Like Venerable Nyanananda says, imagine somebody gives you a bucket and you're emptying out the well. Do you keep any water with you? No, you just pull up the water with the bucket and you toss it next next so you're always this until it's emptied so there's nothing being held on to and that is the relinquishment part of it which is the last of the four which is the patinisaga the giving up part when this is maintained the mind is no longer agitated the mind no longer being or staying agitated suddenly there is nibbana there is release so that is how it is described in the dhamma in the vinaya that is how Lord Buddha describes it, that it takes place. Uh, so, of course, there's the other method. Uh, this is through the wisdom part. The other part is through the jhanas, where the person who has already become an anagami at this stage can penetrate into the cessation of feeling and perception. And after they have emerged out of that state, they attain arahantship. So, and if it was uh, an arahant who had uh, attained magga, only the path, they end up experiencing the fruit of, or the pala portion of the, the final. Uh, as Ajahn Mahabua would say, if you're walking into the sala from the, from, from the, you know, the road or the, you know, platform, one foot is on the sala floor, but the other foot is there. So that is the arahant with the magga. Both feet are not in the sala inside the hall of the, where the Buddha statue is. So when you have lifted and you brought it and you placed it next to the other foot and placed it on the floor of the sala, that's when you have the arahant pala, the fruition uh, stage of arahantship, which happens in, uh, if not through wisdom, then through the... Uh, stage of cessation of feeling and perception. So, uh, and in case you were wondering, how about the other two stages? How can one attain to those? Uh, there is the practice of the wisdom, obviously, but the meditation incorporated with both. And you can attain it through hearing, listening to the Dhamma, reading the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma, uh, practicing, focusing on one single object. That's why we don't dig, you know, poke around many different holes looking for gold, stick to one. Uh, those are uh, the methods. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I'm getting exhausted, but uh, I wanted to uh, approach those as well. So I would love for us to continue next week. So uh, hopefully you could join and uh, let us share some merits.
May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find health relief. May all beings share in these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of wholesome happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share in these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Be well. Uh, may the blessings of the triple gem be with you and your loved ones. And uh, may you stay close to your ox, <laughs> either on it, if you're at that point where you don't even have to worry because the ox is faithfully following you, then so be it. Beautiful. Otherwise, keep holding to the tail of the ox or look for the hoof prints of the ox. Tear the whole place down looking for it. Find it uh, before that sword comes down on us. Uh, we don't know at what point. So, and... Uh, May your smile never leave your heart and your lips. And I'll see you next week. Be well.